Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. So much going on in the world of horse racing. Um, what do you want to do on the show today? Well, first thing I want to do is compliment you on that orange shirt knot. I love it. Live and enough, Horse Center. Let's do it. Hey, you know what? Saratoga, Del Mar, I know they're hot and heavy. This week, though, this weekend is one of the relatively slower weekends. There's some nice turf racing. Don't get me wrong. Nice turf racing. We got Malathot returning in the country club, American Oaks, Matt. But we're going to use this week, a slightly slow week at these two great tracks, to bust out our first top 10 for the Breeders' Cup Classic, Matt. We're just over three months away for the $6 million big one that should probably will decide horse of the year this year. Maybe not. We'll see. But anyway, top 10. You ready for it? Let's go. Let's go. Who's on top, Matt? We're going to hold off just a minute because I want to talk about what happened last week because those races will affect what we see on our top 10. We'll start with your Jersey Shore, your favorite track, Monmouth Park, Matt. I was not a happy camper after the Haskell was run. First, I was scared to death of what might have happened, and then I was disappointed with what did happen. Yes, Brian, I'm sure you were the, uh, the number one hot rod Charlie fan on Horse Center. Um, uh, it was a great race down the stretch, if you forget about what happened uh, uh, at around the, uh, the eighth pole, um, where hot rod Charlie and Mandaloon pretty much, I guess, as expected, um, threw it down and battled head to head uh, to the wire where hot rod Charlie prevailed. But the inquiry sign went up pretty quickly, and in my eyes, rightfully so. Yeah, well, optics of the race, I think they, I think they almost had to disqualify Hot Rod Charlie because what everybody saw, and of course, it's what no one wants to see in a horse race, and thankfully, thankfully, Midnight Bourbon and Paco Lopez were okay. That's the best thing that I took out of this, Haskell. It certainly opened the door for more discussion on the uh, no use of the whip at Monmouth Park or the riding crop at Monmouth Park, uh, and from what I've seen, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I've never ridden a horse in a horse race. Uh, but from what I've seen, all the jockeys that I've seen commented on it say, hey, that would have made all the difference if Flavian Pratt was able to use a left-handed whip. And then I saw a lot of non-jockeys say, no, the, the whip had no bearing on what happened in this Haskell. What's your take, sir? I don't think I agree with either one of those uh, opinions that you expressed, because certainly both sides... Uh, jockeys that were commenting and then fans that were commenting were were uh, doing that to push forward their agendas on the no whip rule, uh, which I certainly disagree with. That was uh, uh, not crafted uh, in, in in a smart way at all. But anyway, I uh, to me the what was going on was pretty clear, um, and, and it may have happened because the no whip rule existed. And that was Flavian Pratt um, doing everything he could to urge his horse, flapping the reins around uh, um, with, with the whip in his right hand. And I honestly feel like he, um, I, I don't know whether he was distracted by that or not, um, or he was more focused on trying to urge his horse without the use of whip, but he clearly made a bad judgment and moved in front of Midnight Bourbon without leaving enough space. And, and, and for that reason, the, the steward's decision was extremely fast in a very big, for a very big race because it was that clear a call. Okay, it wasn't quite as clear to me, uh, but I agree with most of what you said. Uh, Devil's Advocate, Mandaloon did move a little bit off the rail. He came out a little bit. Yeah, don't, don't, don't shake your head, Matt. We see the head on where he came out about one path and, and Hot Rod Charlie came in a couple paths. The other thing was I, I've seen and, and, and Paco Lopez uh, uh, kind of tried to take his horse outside quickly and that caused the clipping of heels. I don't know. I mean, obviously Flavian Pratt moved too soon, probably to see the other horse, probably to engage in a stretch duel. And it was, you're right. Uh, my eyes were on Midnight Bourbon for the most part, but what, when I did look up 
and stop gasping at, at the at what I saw. It was a great stretch duel between two of the best three-year-olds in the country. I thought Mandolin stepped up with a very good performance, probably the best performance of his career. And I thought Hot Rod Charlie was the best horse in the race and ran another very good race, as he often does, without seeming to collect the winner's check. Uh, and kudos to Midnight Bourbon, because it could have been disaster. And for that horse to stumble as badly as he did go down and 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 just get up and run away and, and seem to come out of the race 100% fine is is obviously saying something about that horse as well. Yeah, he was pretty athletic to uh, clip the heels and never actually go down, stumble badly, but uh, was able to stay on his feet and and keep moving ahead, which, you know, made the uh, made that part of it look uh, less badly than it could have if he had actually uh, uh, gone down to the ground. Yeah, Hot Rod Charlie, Mandaloon, certainly two horses that both of us uh, want in our Breeders' Cup Classic Top 10 horses we need in that top 10 and, and they both look to be still getting even better as the uh, as the summer of their three-year-old seasons rolls around now now as far as the other race that i think has breeders cup classic implications moving forward that was the san diego on saturday at del mar and i noticed quickly that you did not include any horse from the san diego on the list that you sent me for your breeders cup classic top 10 matt express train won the race uh, I think that the horses that ran second and third both looked pretty good in that in that the second horse finisher lightly raced, certainly lightly raced on dirt, was really running at the end. And the third horse, Royal Ship, was kind of stuck down on the rail. What a bad trip for the favorite, I thought. But a deserving winner in Express Train. Yeah, I think Express Train in this in in the San Diego uh, ran the best race. Um, you know, right out of the gate, he kind of got in a comfortable position uh, in second place and kind of sat there uh, for a good portion of the race. And, and then, you know, uh, heading into the final turn, uh, moved up, coming out of the turn, had control of the race, had the lead. And to his credit, he did have to fight off challenges from more than one horse. Um, uh, you mentioned Royal Ship. He, he put some pressure on. Uh, Mo Mesa, who we talked about before the race, also made a move and put on some pressure. And then, uh, the, then one last late challenge on the outside and Express Train uh, did a nice job holding off all those challenges. Yeah, I think he's a nice horse, uh, and I, I think he's a horse that uh, has potential to be a Breeders' Cup Classic uh, contender, uh, but we shall see. I, I think the trip that he got was certainly the best trip of the main contenders in that San Diego. All right, Matt, enough talk about last week. Let's get right to the Classic Top 10. Who's on top? Mad Max. Maxfield's our number one. Of course he is, Matt. We also threw in some odds. And, and, and I, think, I think with these odds, Matt, you can see kind of that this is still a very wide open operation, much like we're talking about the Derby months out. Still a wide open kind of race. But Maxfield, for me, he's the one that deserves to be on top. Yeah, I agree with that. And certainly uh, three months out, there are so many big uh, uh, races that are preps for the Breeders' Cup Classic, winning your ends, the Pacific Classic, the Whitney, the Woodward, just to rattle off a few that will uh, uh, certainly help clarify this picture. But Maxfield, that recent win in uh, Stephen Foster um, was really impressive and, and gave Maxfield the top spot, I think, in in both of our eyes, that was a win and you're in. He's got his spot uh, wrapped up in the field. Of course, he was also second uh, uh, in the Ali Sheba this year and in the mine shaft and had that third place in the big cap. Yeah, yeah. He, In fact, Matt, he's seven of eight lifetime. He's three of four this year. I will mention the Woodward was one of the races you mentioned. And I, and I wonder about the Woodward this year because, of course, they kind of switched the Jockey Club Gold Cup, which is now at Saratoga. And then the Woodward will be a little bit later at Belmont. So I wonder how much the bearing the Woodward will have on all this. Maybe the Jockey Club Gold Cup now becomes a bigger, more viable prep for the Breeders' Cup Classic with uh, horses stretch, uh, uh, spacing their races out more. Yeah, the Sun of Street Sets, number one for me, pretty much all year. Um, 
trained by Brendan Walsh and a good Dolphin homebred. I just love the way that Maxfield runs. I think he is a mile and a quarter horse, Matt, but I, I will re remind everyone that his one mile and a quarter effort so far came out in California, his only race out in California. Of course, he was scratched for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile a few years ago, uh, and that's the race he lost. So there are certainly questions to be answered for Maxfield, including probably a very tough race coming up in the Whitney, which is also expected to attract number two on our list, Matt. And I think number two on our list is a little bit higher than most people have, but we both had him number two. He looks to be the speed of the Breeders' Cup Classic. Of course, I'm talking about Nick's go. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, I think that, that we both put him higher. And I think that was, you know, on the heels of that performance uh, um, in the Corn Husker handicap, where he bounced back from uh, his fourth place uh, finishes it from the Saudi Cup and the Met Mile and look more like, look a lot like the horse that was so impressive winning the Pegasus World Cup in the beginning of this year and going back to last year when he won the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Um, that early speed and uh, tactical speed and that ability to just uh, blow the field away down the stretch. Yeah, the, the, the controlling speed at two turns looks to be right up this horse's alley, this Maryland bred son of painter, Matt. Certainly, I think he is a bigger, an even bigger threat when he gets to control that speed over a distance of ground. We'll have to see if he can do it at 10 furlongs against the very best, but I think that kind of speed is always dangerous. This horse has been a little bit in and out in his career. He was a good two-year-old. Things kind of went off track. Seven of 21 lifetime two of four the corn husker was a big performance mad and we may laugh at the corn husker but fort larned and black tie affair came from the corn husker to win the breeders cup classic so there you go we'll see no horse has ever gone from the dirt mile winning the dirt mile to winning the classic but we both think nicks go is a real threat for trainer brad cox and brad cox has the next horse on our list as well matt that is the top three-year-old on our list as well essential quality i think he's one of the early favorites for the breeders cup classic yeah, no doubt, Brian. Uh, um, the, you know, essential quality, another one, three wins from four starts. His only defeat this year was was uh, in the Kentucky Derby going that uh, 10 furlong distance, but he sure did look good uh, winning the Belmont Stakes over Hot Rod Charlie, who we, we know once again affirmed his uh, quality um, as a racehorse in the, in the Haskell, uh, essential quality. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, where he's going next. Brad Cox said uh, Jim Dandy, then he was kind of a little wishy-washy this weekend, but uh, um, he'll, I will definitely see him uh, in the Travers at Saratoga. Yeah, and that, that raises a question, whether it's both races at Saratoga, the Jim Dandy and the Travers, or just the Travers. Uh, the Breeders' Cup Classic could possibly, uh, maybe more likely than not, become his first race against older horses. So we need to see where these three-year-olds stack up against the older horses, Matt. Uh, they look good. Horses like Essential Quality, Hot Rod Charlie, Mandaloon, to maybe name the top three. But uh, we haven't seen them run against uh, older horses, so I'm looking forward to it. Maybe we'll get to see Hot Rod Charlie try older horses first in the Pacific Classic. Essential quality has been terrific ever since he debuted at Churchill down six of seven lifetime. I think the Belmont proved that he can go a distance clearly with that mile and a half performance. So uh, yeah, he deserves to be high on the list. Next horse on our list is a, is a, is a bit of more of a question mark, Matt, but on the other hand, maybe he's accomplished more than any horse this year. That's Silver State. Yeah, and maybe he's, you know, in that statement accomplished more than any other because um, you know, he kind of came from, you know, uh, unknown status a little bit for uh, Steve Asmussen, one of these classic Asmussen horses that have gotten better and better as they've gotten older. Three wins um, at Oaklawn Park, uh, including the Oaklawn Handicap, which was a grade two. And then that just spectacular victory in the Met Mile against the really tough field, as the Met Mile usually always is getting him grade one status. He's getting a little rest after that and deservedly so, but he certainly won. Uh, where is he going to go in the Breeders' Cup? Is he going to go in the Dirt Mile or is he going to go in the Classic? Yeah, and, and I think the Classic is the more likely option 
uh, for Silver State, but we just don't know looking at the past performances now. He's never been be, uh, uh, farther than nine furlongs. He has some really good performances at a mile, like the Met Mile, and shorter. So, yeah, that is, that is a question mark, and maybe it will be decided in his next few races whether he goes to the Classic or not. But, hey, uh, what he's accomplished this year, it's hard to look past. He's actually won six in a row after showing some flashes early in his career. Silver State's been very good. We need to see more of Silver State. Ten furlongs probably being the big question. The next horse on the list, I have less question about ten furlongs. Matt, he's the son of Oxbow. We've already talked about him a little bit in this show, and that's Hot Rod Charlie. I think deep down, uh, if you're talking who are among the favorites, and from what I've seen, and, and even odds overseas, Hot Rod Charlie is one of the shortlist favorites now for the Breeders' Cup Classic. Yeah, I would guess so. He was certainly uh, uh, in the top four or five or so of contenders um, at this point. Um, you know, you look at his uh, uh, stats, starts, wins, and, and such. It, it, it doesn't look great. You have to look at his performances on the track, which have all been uh, outstanding. Um, you know, some bad luck in there, as we've talked about already. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see if trainer Doug O'Neill does make the next step with him in the Pacific Classic against older horses. I think it would be a great move considering the quality of the older horses on the West Coast. Yeah, Hot Rod Charlie, uh, I agree with you. If he does run in the Pacific Classic, I think that is a big thing because 10 furlongs at Del Mar, that's really the only chance any of these horses on the list are going to get to run 10 furlongs at Del Mar before the Breeders' Cup Classic. So having that under your belt and doing well in that race, I think would be big. Hey, he, he's, he's two of 10 now lifetime uh, after we uh, put the uh, disqualification onto his official record. So he doesn't have the record of literally anyone on this field. He's one of five this year. But then you look at his, his, his grade one races, the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile, the uh, Kentucky Derby, the Belmont and the Haskell. I mean, it's hard to go past him. We know he can get a distance. He's proved it in the Belmont. He won the mile three sixteenths Louisiana Derby very impressively. Uh, we need to see him against older horses. We also need to see him get past his rival, essential quality. Number six on the list, Matt, is, uh, and this is the one I want to talk to you, to you a little bit about. It's country grammar, and you had him quite a bit higher on your list than I did. And you just mentioned the lack of quality for the California horses. So I want you to explain that a little bit with your rating of country grammar quite so high. Well, country grammar uh, would be, in my eyes, the best uh, horse on this list heading to that 10 furlong Breeders' Cup Classic uh, with his victory in the big cap, uh, sorry, in the Hollywood Gold Cup going that going that distance. So if I have to pick one horse on the West Coast that I think is the best horse, um, I think Country Grammar is that horse for the Breeders' Club Classic. And I, and I think he's way above the rest of them. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I, I, I don't know with the close races with Royal Ship, if I personally can rate him well above the rest of them, Royal Ship, Express Train and so on. But uh, interesting to see. He was trained by Bob Baffert out on the West Coast, but now, of course, he's trained by Todd Pletcher, so he'll get some East Coast racing, it looks like, before he goes to that Breeders' Cup Classic. Um, it, it, it kind of depends on how good you think horses like Express Train and Royal, Grammar, uh, Royal Ship are, at least for me, to see how good country grammar is. I'm not sure who he's beaten yet, and I might like the West Coast horses better than you do, so... That's a question mark in his, uh, in his log book. Number seven on the list, Matt, maybe we should have had him higher, is Mandaloon. Mandaloon is the horse, of course, five of eight now lifetime, maybe six of eight lifetime soon, three of six this year, maybe four of six soon, as we still wait for that Kentucky Derby uh, result to be resolved. But Mandaloon just looks like a horse who continues to be on the improve. Uh, I was impressed with his rail run in the Haskell. This is the third horse. For trainer Brad Cox on the list. Yeah, yeah, you, you have to be impressed with uh, what Mandaloon done has done, and 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 you can only say uh, for a couple of these, Mandaloon got a win in your in spot into the classic by from winning the Haskell. So uh, uh, he's in the race if uh, 
if Brad Cox is going to go. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how many of the Brad Cox forces actually end up in there. Uh, Mandaloon seems to show up and be right there all the time, except for that one time uh, in, in the fairgrounds recently. Yeah, the son of Vincent Mischief, you, th you draw a line through that uh, Louisiana Derby where he was kind of there at the 316th pole and he just backed out. Uh, he's been consistent. Uh, I wonder, you know, and, I, and I've seen it mentioned whether he hangs a little bit. I, I don't think that was the case in the Haskell. Um, yeah. it, was, it was a good battle. And I think Hot Rod Charlie, you know, again, I said was a little bit better, but it was close. Mandaloon ran a big race. Um, couldn't get Medina Spirit in the Derby, but he, on the other hand, he looks like a horse who can handle 10 furlongs. The third three-year-old on our list. Next on that list, Matt, was, uh, was mostly my doing. I had Express Train. Uh, on the list after that win at Del Mar. One of the things I like about this horse, the Sunny Union Rags, he's won four of 12 lifetime, two of five this year. But if you look at his record at Del Mar, it's pretty good, including that San Diego win. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Brian. Um, that was a nice victory. But as you said, I, we and we both agreed, he really got uh, an ideal perfect trip in there. And, uh, you know, um, kudos for that. Yeah, and I, I do think he's a horse who can work out that trip. I think he's a horse who is just too far back in the Cole Cup. So I think he's a horse who can have that nice tactical speed, which comes in, in handy in a 10 for a long race. Trained by John Sheriffs, trader who knows to get knows how to get horses ready for 10 for longs, but uh, distance still may be a little bit of a question mark for Express Train. Number nine on the list, Matt, again, my doing, uh, I, I just feel like Dr. Post, I know, and and this reminds me a little bit of connections, the same connections a few years ago, Vinny Viola, St. Elias Stables, and Todd Fletcher, and people beat on me for, for sticking with Vino Rosso so far. I'm not trying to uh, toot my own horn here, Matt, but sometimes horses just develop, they mature, and sometimes they turn a corner. I could see this happening for Dr. Post because I thought the Monmouth Cup was the best race of his career, and it was also his first race with blinkers. Yeah, absolutely, Brian, the best race of his career. I liked the horse a lot going into, into the Monmouth Cup. As a matter of fact, there was a, 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 a Monmouth Park, a Saratoga, 20 cent pick six. I singled Dr. Post in that pick six uh, because I thought that, you know, I, I was willing to draw a line through that Met Mile, uh, not because uh, that not because Dr. Post was an inferior horse, but just because that's, that is not the kind of race that's gonna suit the style of Dr. Post. Uh, to me, the, the two turns, and, and, and again, much like you mentioned, much like the running style of Vino Rosso. And, and, and he, Dr. Post looked uh, terrific winning the Monmouth Cup. Yes, that was only a grade three, and yes, he's got a lot more to prove. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, and I agree with what you're saying, on the other hand, I think the Monmouth Cup was a heck of a lot better race overall than the Westchester, both in his performance and the horses he beat, because I think the horses he beat in the Monmouth Cup are underrated horses. Yeah, they're not grade one horses, and Dr. Prost needs to prove that he could beat grade one horses because he hasn't done it yet. He was second in the Belmont last year, a shortened Belmont, nine for a long Belmont. So he needs to prove he can beat grade one horses, and he needs to prove that he can do it at 10 furlongs. But I agree with you here. I think he's better suited for two turns and longer races than that one turn, one mile that he saw in the Met Mile. Anyway, I think he's possibly turning a corner and could move his way up the list. Pletcher is talking about the Pacific Classic as a possible next race for Dr. Post. And just like we said with Hot Rod Charlie, I think that would be a great option for the New York-based Dr. Post. Number 10 on the list, Matt, I think is the biggest wild card on the list. His name is Life is Good. And when we last saw Life is Good, that's San Felipe. He was running off the screen for trainer Bob Baffert. Now he's trained by Todd Fletcher, still undefeated. But if you've noticed lately, he's been working out regularly at Keeneland. Yes, Brian. And, and you're right. Certainly the biggest wild card. Uh, haven't seen him since March. He's perfect up until then. One win as a two-year-old, three wins this year as a three-year-old. Um, you know, we've, we've been saying it a lot lately, was trained by Bob Baffert, is now trained by uh, Todd Pletcher. And, and we'll see uh, with that one. Um, he, like you said, has had some workouts at Keeneland. I'm not sure if he's in Todd's barn yet. 
If not, I think it's I think it's going to happen soon um, up at uh, Saratoga and and what that means, how long it will take uh, Pletcher to think that life is good is ready to, you know, is is, is race ready. We will find out, but at least he's with Pletcher. And to me, that's a signal that they want this horse to run again. Yeah, absolutely. And those three workouts at Keeneland is a tip off that he's at least getting closer to returning, uh, which is different than some of the horses we're going to mention that are not on the list, Matt. But hey, if you look at that San Felipe and what he did to Medina Spirit, and then of course, Medina Spirit comes back and wins the Kentucky Derby for now. Uh, I, I think you have to at least consider life is good uh, as a potential star. And if he can come back in the next month or two uh, onto uh, race day, then he becomes a horse we need to start talking about for the Breeders' Cup Classic. Horses we are not, that are not on this list, Matt, Medina Spirit won the Kentucky Derby, but his works have been inconsistent ever since. Yes, they have. I, I don't know. I, I'm not personally, I'm not confident that we're going to see Medina Spirit back on the track anytime soon. Yeah. And, and, and I should have said since the Preakness when he ran third, but he's only had one workout and now there's another gap. Mystic Guide, of course, unfortunately, we just found out has a bone chip and it's hard to imagine him being ready for the Breeders' Cup Classic. Charlton was retired, of course, uh, another one of the top horses this year. And Ron Bauer, Matt, your, uh, your Preakness pick uh, is, is now getting a rest as well. Yeah, so that, yeah, that was a little bit of a surprise. And, you know, starting, starting off a rest right now in the middle of July, yeah, you know, makes it tough to wonder if uh, that horse is gonna be able to be ready for the big races late in the summer. It's still a very nice three-year-old, a versatile three-year-old who's won on multiple surfaces. And I, I really look forward to the return of Ron Bauer. We just can't put him on the list right now. We didn't put any fillies and mares on the list, Matt. Latruska has been awesome this year. I still think Monomoy Girl and Swiss Girl, have, a Swiss skydiver, have the potential to come back and be huge, uh, hugely impactful uh, on, on the road to the Breeders' Cup. But it's hard to imagine where they are right now, any of them going for the 10 for a long Breeders' Cup Classic. Yeah, yeah, certainly not the classic. Maybe if thing if things go really well, they can get back to uh, to the distaff. But uh, you know, haven't heard much going on, much training with uh, Monomoy Girl. I think Swiss Skydiver is farther along than uh, than Monomoy. Yeah, Swiss Skydiver is scheduled to run Sunday in the Shoe V. Uh, although there there is a barn issue with. Uh, uh, one horse testing positive for uh, 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 the herpes virus there. So she may not be allowed to run Sunday in the shoe V. Uh, by my standards, I think is uh, one of the top older males in the country, but I don't believe he's a 10 for a long horse, Matt. I think he should go Breeders' Cup third mile. He's not on the list. Nor are Max Player and Happy Saver the first and third finishers from the recent Suburban. Yeah, uh, uh, Max Player looked good winning that Suburban, but again, you know, he has not really had a, a win against this quality of, of horse. And, and Happy Saver, you know, is another one for Pletcher. I, I think the potential is there, but, you know, he seems to be another one like um, Dr. Post and Vino Rosso that, you know, is, good, is developing gradually. So we'll have to see. Again, you know, it's the middle of July and, you know, uh, he's going to have to uh, do something in some of the big races coming up, whether uh, it's in the Whitney or the, the Woodward or defending his uh, uh, title in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Yeah, and Happy Saver is a horse I would not give up on uh, oh. just because he lost his first race on a sloppy track in his second start of the year coming out of a one mile prep. Anyway, folks, that's our top 10. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, a little over three months for the Breeders' Cup Classic. So Matt and I wanted to get this out here now, our list. Tell us who you agree with. Tell us where we're completely off base with. We appreciate your comments as always. We appreciate you watching every week. Don't forget, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation. And if you will turn on those notifications, that's a good idea as well to not miss another episode of Four Seven. Matt, can I get a party shot from you, my good friend? Absolutely, Brian. I do want to mention I met some nice Horse Center fans. I met a couple of Horse Center fans on the back stretch at Monmouth Park uh, before the race. 
that week. And then I spent, uh, I spent a race with a horse center fan on Haskell day down on the apron. Uh, it was good seeing them. Um, and of course, I want to thank our great producer, Tony Bada Bing for putting together the show. Oh, Matt, you got to love the Horse Center fans, the salt of the earth, some of the best people out there. Uh, we do appreciate you watching, folks. Thanks to the, uh, our, our, our sponsor as well, the best contest site out there, that's Derby Wars. Thanks, as always, for the graphics from Candace Curtis and, of course, to Tony Bing. We couldn't do it without you. Folks, we'll be back next week. Big show talking more Saratoga, Del Mar. The Jim Dandy is a, a little over a week away, so we have that to look forward to. We'll see you right back here on Horse Center.